Gorap. I am the Senior Web Accessibility Analyst here, uh, well not here at Penn, but uh, at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, and today we're going to talk a little bit about how to manage accessibility in higher education. Um, if you folks are not from a higher education institution, totally fine. Um, uh, we Penn has a very decentralized campus with varying uh, degrees of uh, teams have budgets and team sizes. So I'm sure that whatever issues we have uh, and challenges we've run into might be very similar to some the ones that you folks have. There we go. So uh, very quickly, just going to do a uh, rundown uh, about our agenda. Um, and if you do want to access these slides, you can go to the bit.ly link that I have on the screen. It is bit.ly backslash dcnj underscore access. And you can get a copy uh, of these slides. Uh, so first, we're going to uh, we're going to look at a high level um, overview of what accessibility looks like at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, next, we'll go into some key parts of what uh, a successful accessibility program looks like, um, and then we're going to talk a little bit about ways about communicating and talking about accessibility. Uh, also, a lot of folks always have questions about procurement, um, so we're definitely going to spend some time on that. Um, then we will have, um, I'm sure we'll have a lot of time for uh, any questions that you folks uh, may have. So accessibility at Penn. Um, I will start off by giving a little bit of background information. So uh, in August of 2019, we ent uh, Penn entered into what's called an early resolution agreement with the Office for Civil Rights, which is under the Department of Education. Um, basically, when we entered into this agreement, we, uh, we told the government we would do a few things. Um, the first one would be to hire a full-time uh, accessibility professional, which was me. Um, we were also going to implement a accessible reporting process, so that way anybody who is using any pen website or application has an easy way to raise accessibility issues um, to us. Um, we also had to implement a, a reporting and monitoring um, uh, we had to implement a, a monitoring and reporting tool um, to make sure we're able to track things over time. Um, what our team looks like, uh, so very uh, very small team of one, it's just me. Um, I am the only full-time employee dedicated to uh, digital accessibility at the university and I am housed in our central IT department under web hosting. Uh, though I am one employee, um, I, that is focused just on digital accessibility. Um, I do have a team around me, um, but they are not accessibility professionals. Um, my manager is a web hosting manager and he handles um, our uh, websites and Pantheon instances. Um, I also have our director of application um, the director of um, applications um, is also on my team, as well as the, uh, the university's principal technology advisor. I check in at, uh, with my team um, at least uh, once every two weeks, um, and along with my manager, I have frequent communication with. Um, so even though I'm the only person dedicated to accessibility, um, the people that are on my team um, have been at Penn for at least 25 years in some cases, and they're the ones who know all of the little penisms and all the connections across campus that someone like me may not have. Uh, we also have what's called Web Compliance Officers, or WCOs. Um, so it is not possible for me to, anytime I see a web, access, a web accessibility issue on a website, to track down the person who can fix that. But what I do have is a list of folks who have been designated from every school, center, or department, who if I do see an issue on their website, I can just contact them and they can relay that information to their team. Um, this also makes it a lot easier for me to blast out uh, communications if we have any type of updates or things that folks need to be aware of, I can just push it to these folks and I think there's about like 65, 70 of them on campus and they can relay that information accordingly. So we do have a digital accessibility policy. Um, we have, Currently we uh, look to WCAG 2.1 level AA um, and this is for any websites or web apps that uh, created or, or undergo significant revisions after April 1st, uh, 2022. Um, I did think it was a little bit of a cruel joke to announce a new accessibility policy on April Fool's Day, but that was the date that uh, was approved. Um, so for any websites or web applications that were launched or created before um, April Fool's Day of last year, um, our standards still remained WCAG 2.0 level AA. Um, but 
if they go through any type of um, significant revision or uh, modification, and the way that we define that is um, any adoption or migration to a new platform um, or a modification to the majority of um, a content or another change that substantially alters um, the usability or design of a web page or section of web pages. So if you're going to update your stuff and it's going to be a pretty major update, you need to update everything to 2.1. Um, Basically, if you're putting anything out on the web and it's on a pen property, it's covered under our digital accessibility policy. So obviously our websites and web applications, um, but also any type of electronic uh, resource for instruction, information distri distribution, or communication. Um, so anything from our PDFs to our YouTube videos, um, things that we post on sh social media as well. Um, also our online instructional materials and obviously our online events. Um, this is not a comprehensive list, but uh, pretty much if it's online, you're responsible to make it accessible. Um, we do have a bunch of campus-wide resources. Um, so. Again, I'm in a central IT department at the university, so f um, IT folks who are uh, who need help, they're already used to going to that uh, to that department, so they know they can find me there. Um, some of the things that we provide um, is we always do free accessibility audits, and we do not have any plans to ever charge people for that um, because we want people to use us as a resource. Uh, we also offer a bunch of training uh, trainings, workshops and additional support. So um, while we do offer, uh, we try to run at least one to two um, campus-wide events um, open to anybody who wants to join um, a month. But uh, we also too will, um, when, you know, when going through, when talking to people or if we notice on um, in one of our monitoring softwares that there is, you know, let's say a group of sites that belong to, you know, one center or department, maybe I'll reach out and I'll target them and offer individualized uh, trainings for their teams as well. Uh, we also do QA testing on any dev and design deliverable. Um, because we're very decentralized, we also don't know when sites are uh, when new sites are going to be launching, which is a little weird being in a central IT web hosting uh, you know web hosting team and not always knowing when websites are launching. But um, we do always uh, when we are talking to people, we say if you are going to be going through a redesign, our team is always happy to be involved in any part of the process, um, whether it's from reviewing contracts um, to evaluating design deliverables um, or going through a full accessibility audit during development, we want people to know they can always reach out to us. Um, we'll, uh, we do also, again, offer um, consultation on vendor and pro uh, vendors um, and procurement, but we're gonna go over that uh, in a few slides. And then we also offer weekly office hours. Um, I have a Calendly link that uh, I send out to people and it will put time on my calendar. I think it's Tuesdays through Thursdays, three to five, and I encourage people to use it for uh, you know small questions, big questions. The most important thing is that when you're building out an accessibility program, your accessibility uh, expert needs to be very visible and very available. Um, we also have a few groups on campus. Um, we have the adorably named ALT group, uh, which is our accessibility and learning technologies group. And this is just folks from across campus in varying roles who get together um, and we chat about accessibility topics. Uh, we're also an IAP organizational member, which is the International Association uh, of Accessibility Professionals. Um, so if you've ever heard of uh, CPACs or people getting certified, they're likely very going through IAP. Um, and we also have a dedicated Slack channel that any person um, with a upenn.edu email address can join and uh, chat about accessibility. Uh, some of the, uh, we use three play media for our captioning needs um, and we are currently evaluating uh, PDF remediation tools um, since I'm um, sure if you folks also work at universities, you know that we love our PDFs um, and we have probably millions of them. Um, so we are currently looking at ways to uh, make PDF remediation a lot easier for our staff. Um, Obviously, we need a way to uh, monitor at scale. Um, so what we use, uh, we use a tool called Pope Tech. Um, it's built off of the Wave engine. And what this lets us do is input all of our sites um, into it and we can crawl our sites, scan our sites, and we, can, and we have a, a real nice dashboard uh, where we can track our progress over time. Um, we've been using this since January of 2020, and I think we're tracking roughly 580 sites. Um, that said, I always find si uh, I always find uh, rogue sites out in the wild, um, and have to, we'll have to put them in. But uh, 
Pope Tech is, uh, has been a, uh, a great partner for us um, because they have uh, they truly listen to our uh, our unique uh, needs um, and have helped uh, make changes to their plat platform to better suit uh, you know our evolving uh, accessibility needs. Um, on when we were talking about our policy, I did mention that uh, our online course content is covered under our web accessibility policy, um, and we are currently piloting uh, Pope Tech's Canvas integration um, in order for us to uh, make a. Uh, to track and maintain our uh, accessibility of our course content. Um, another thing that uh, we do is uh, we offer a Drupal starter theme, um, and this is something that me and my manager created. Uh, I, I'm a Drupal front-end developer by trade. Um, so uh, we maintain this centrally, and uh, one of the modules that we actually use is the editorially, uh, the editorially module that's in, that's in our upstream. Um, and that helps us with uh, making sure that any, when we turn over the site to folks, uh, that the content editors are able to output accessible, co uh, accessible content. Um, this theme is designed for, uh, for groups that don't really have budgets or teams. So that way we know, we know the theme's accessible, the folks we're turning it on for, they're not developers and they're not gonna touch that code. So that's why we really needed to focus on making sure that uh, these content creators and editors are able to make sure everything that they're outputting is looking good. So now we're gonna uh, look at some key parts of an accessibility program. Um, this is a high-level framework of, um, of, how, of the different types of organizational components that you need to think through uh, when rolling out a new program. Um, the first and most important thing that you need is to gain top-level buy-in. Uh, buy um, so not everybody is going to listen to an accessibility analyst, um, but somebody will listen to the provost or the CIO. Um, and you need to make sure that if you, are, if you run into any issues or if there is a major risk involved, that you're gonna have those people in your corner and, they're going to, and they will support you when you need to. Um, one of the other things that you need to make sure that you do is um, ensure that we're defining accessibility policies. I'm not sure uh, how, you know, how uh, much understanding you folks all have about the, uh, about the legality of accessibility, but there, when we say something is accessible or it needs to be accessible, um, we need to define a set of standards for that. Um, so we point to, we like many other organizations, uh, point to WCAG, uh, we personally use 2.1, level AA, um, but you need to make sure that you're all, that that standard is set because if a vendor is saying, oh, well, it's compliant, uh, you need to be able to say, well, we're looking at our list here and it's not. So you need to be able to standardize that so you're always working on the same page. Um, some of the other things um, is to develop strategy and um, implementation plans. So this is kind of where we are in the process right now. Um, so before I started in January of 2020, um, there was nobody in this role. So uh, you know, when you look at uh, institutions like Princeton or Harvard, uh, you know, they have you know, they have multiple people working on accessibility, and they're a little bit further along um, than we are. But uh, we also look to these institutions um, to see what's worked for them and how we can apply that um, at Penn as well. Um, it's really important that the people that you're talking to are, are, are decision makers um, because I obviously can't review everything that goes out um, or that comes in. So uh, we'll go, and we'll go over a little bit of that in the next few slides. Um, so again, we talked a little bit about getting that top level support and standardizing your interpretation, your goals and your tools. Um, so if I, we use Pope Tech, which is built off of the Wave engine, um, but if we're, work, if we're gonna be working with a vendor and they say they do their own accessibility testing, well, we need to know what tool they're using. Different tools have different results. So we, again, we need to make sure that we're on the same page with things. Um, defining an accessibility policy and a target, again, very important. Um, and we need to ensure that staff can easily connect with your team and users can easily bring web accessibility issues to your attention. It is very, very uh, easy to get in the weeds with accessibility and want to make sure that you have no errors and no alerts on your pages when you're running the when you're running either the Wave engine or looking at a Pope Text scan. But it is really important to take a progress um, over perfection approach. Um, not all accessibility issues are uh, are 
of the same severity or of the same risk. Um, you also don't want to spend you know, a bunch of time and resources fixing accessibility issues that are going to just be resolved in an upcoming release, um, or fixing issues for documents that are only viewed you know, two or three times a year, as opposed to you know, maybe a glaring accessibility issue on, a highly, uh, you know, on one of your most visited pages. Um, support and training um, is probably going to be the, uh, the biggest component of this. I mean, it takes a lot of time to be able to offer these trainings and support, but you know, I need to be able to make a bunch of me's across campus. Um, so it's important to understand, uh, to understand that staff will have var varying degrees of accessibility and technical knowledge and experience. Um, some folks who are responsible for maintaining websites, um, their whole uh, their whole center may just have three staff people, none of which are you know developers or formally trained in content management systems. So the way that my uh, my team supports them is going to be way different than um, the way that we need to support either Penn Libraries or Wharton, who are you know who have a lot of dedicated accessibility staff, um, you know, and accessibility ambassador programs and doing all this really awesome stuff. But they have they have big teams. They have resources. Some of these other groups don't, and those are also uh, some of the areas where you really need to focus your time to. Um, again, offering consistent events open um, to all, but also targeting specific groups where you feel may need that extra support or or specialized training. Um, we do everything from. Uh, workshops for uh, for developers uh, on specific ARIA practices to uh, for or to, right to like plain language for content creators um, design fundamental uh, design fundamentals uh, things on uh, PDF accessibility we ran a, a training event on just how to make accessible tables so you can really go from as general to as specific as um, you feel your uh, your staff and team may need. Um, so next up, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about communication. Um, you may have to tailor your approach um, based on the person's role. Um, people care about different things. Uh, somebody may not necessarily care what accessibility issues are present, but what they may care about is a really expensive lawsuit. So you have, uh, the uh, web aim and the W3C, they have a great, um, a great resource on the different business cases for accessibility. So if you're ever finding that, you know, just doing the right thing isn't convincing enough, um, I highly suggest looking at that page because it does an, a great job of um, outlining how you can speak to different people's different motivations. Um, Again, accessibility may be a new topic uh, for a lot of people, so it's really important to always give examples and demos. Um, for instance, when I uh, when I first started auditing websites, uh, and I would say, uh, you know, and in my uh, report, I would say something like, a, a "Component isn't usable with a screen reader." And I, if you never seen a screen reader in action like that doesn't really mean anything to you and they're like well like I'm like what the hell does that mean so now what I do is if I run into a screen reader issue I'll take a screen recording of that um, I and I also prefer that approach to trying to uh, you know demo that over a zoom call um, so when when you can it's important to show the person exactly what that issue may look like um, for somebody who encounters uh, using assistive technology um, another thing is that, you know, obviously when we're doing audits and reports or, uh, you know, talking about uh, issues on somebody's site, we're going to be talking a lot about the bad things on their site. Um, and a piece of feedback I got from um, a UX uh, researcher that I was working with was uh, kind of like the, the UX of the audits. And he's like, yeah, you know, when we were talking to people, like, is that just like really made them feel bad? And I'm like, I don't want to make anyone like, feel bad about it. So uh, we actually redesigned the way that uh, we deliver our audits because it's also you know you want to tell people what they are doing good. You want to make people you want to make people feel like they're making progress and that everything that they put out there wasn't you know discriminating against people with disabilities. So um, it's good to call out what's working well and uh, you know making sure that people do feel good when they read your audits. Um, we also need to be clear in our requirements and timelines too. Um, so, 
and even if people may not be, uh, you know, they might be super well versed in accessibility, and they may give you some pushback on some stuff, like, oh, I know the color contrast isn't quite right, but you know, but if it's close enough, is that okay? And it's not. Um, and you also need to, it, and you also, again, going back to different team sizes and resources, um, you need to also be okay with um, coming up with compromises or interim, t uh, interim approaches. Again, you know, progress over perfection. It's okay if you have stuff out there that's inaccessible, but you know, maybe we need to look at putting some type of, you know, accessibility statement on your website, or if you had, or if you know that you have a, you know, whole database of stuff, and only like fifty percent of those PDFs are uh, are compliant. You know, put a note on there that says, hey, you know, uh, outlining what your progress is with that, and give a point person that somebody can contact if they need, uh, you know, something in an alternative format. So, being able to discuss an interim approaches is also really good. Um, offer help prioritizing. Uh, there is, again, not all accessibility issues are of the same risk and severity. So, uh, you know, for things that are related to essential functionality, we offer help, you know, prioritizing those things as opposed to things that people just, quite frankly, aren't looking at. Um, and again, call in the big guns when necessary. Um, we ran into a situation. And um, we've only, you know, from the three years that I've you know, been at Penn, we've only had to call in, you know, our, our big guns once. Um, we're, we're we're running into an issue with the software that we use to um, that we use to uh, manage our paychecks, time off, things things like that. And some uh, and a consultant said that they were not able to do something with a screen reader. We were not able to get in contact with the team that uh, with the team that manages the software, um, and this was obviously a super important issue. Um, and after a week or so of just kind of radio silence and you know nobody following back up with us, we're like, all right, well we need to get the C we we need to let the CIO know, like because this is you know, this very very risky to have this out there. And you know, funny enough, when the CIO emails uh, you on while he's on vacation, you know, you end up getting a response very, very fast from that developer who was uh, ignoring you. But um, again, I don't know how fast that issue would have gotten fixed if I wasn't able to, you know, call in somebody who does have that power and authority. Uh, so now we're going to talk a little bit um, about procurement. Um, so the most important things is develop a standard set of questions or required documentation to hand off to your procurement teams. Again, I'm not going to be able to you know, look at every single contract. I don't know everything that comes in and out of our procurement services. Um, and also certain things, if they fall underneath a monetary threshold, don't need to go through a full uh, kind of vetting process. So. Um, uh, on our accessibility website, we do have a page called Working with Vendors um, that has a bunch of questions that you can ask uh, when working with vendors to kind of see how, to get a, you know, a gauge for how robust their accessibility um, knowledge and expertise is. So um, I encourage you to, if you do need help coming up with uh, questions, um, to take a look at that page. Um, and make sure that procurement knows that when when they're asking a vendor uh, you know hey is something accessible the vendor just can't say yes uh, they need to show you something that proves that it's accessible um, two things that you can um, ask for is um, either a, uh, a VPAT, which is a voluntary product accessibility template, which is basically an audit that um, the company has performed on their own software and then can hand it off to you and it will list out the areas that are compliant or are not in compliance and typically offer workarounds for those areas that are not compliant. Um, there is also something what's called a, uh, a heck that which uh, for some of you folks, if you if you work in um, uh, IT security, uh, you may be familiar with the HECVAC. Um, we personally don't use the HECVAC, but um, I know other uh, other universities do. Um, basically, it's when you're going through a security audit of a um, of a piece of software. It has questions for that, but uh, Educause. Um, actually was able in the next version of the HECVAT was able to actually work in um, questions related to accessibility because if you're already going through a, uh, you know, a security audit, well, why don't we just audit for accessibility right there? There's already, uh, you know, if there's already a process for that, let's just work accessibility into that as well. Um, accessibility does need to be cited as a requirement um, in all contracts and RFPs. Um, 
you're going to be if you're going to be evaluating different types of software. So this isn't necessarily uh, web uh, for websites, but if um, you need to understand the landscape of available tools, there just may not be accessible options, and we've run into that. If there if you're looking for a very very specific tool, and there's like four companies that do that, if nobody if none of them are accessible, you know what do you do? Um, so when you are when you encounter issues like that, um, you need to determine the risk of you know well what's the risk of if we deploy this inaccessible um, software or solution, um, and you need to make it known. Um, we in the beginning of the pandemic we uh, were looking at uh, I think it was a Gatherly or Gather Town, um, but it was one of those little online you know online meeting tools where you get a little avatar and you can like walk around uh, you know the bar and hold a glass and a lot of those are a lot of those types of tools just weren't accessible, but um, a lot of our faculty members wanted something like that so they could feel more connected with students over the course of the pandemic, um, and we said you know. Well, these are all the issues with the ones that we've, you know, that we found that we've evaluated. But if we're going to have to procure one of them, you know, we had to get sign off from our CI, our CIO, and our provost. Um, so that way, you know, everyone knew what the risks were if we move forward with this type of tool. Um, when you're working with vendors, um, you can do some uh, like kind of quick spot checks uh, to see how you know how well they actually handle accessibility. So the first thing that you do is just go to their website and run Wave on the home page. Um, if you're working in higher education, you say you have accessibility expertise, your home page should probably reflect that. Um, also, uh, go through their portfolio. Um, when we were evaluating, um, when we were evaluating vendors uh, with procurement uh, recently, um, if I would go to these vendors' websites and I looked up all of their higher education clients and the sites that they did, and I saw how accessible they actually were. Or they were, and, and you know, and it really does give you kind of an idea for uh, you know what they, you know, what they'll say to you, and then what they'll actually do. So. Um, we also really only like to work with vendors who do have accessibility um, expertise in-house on their team. Um, it is totally fine if they outsource, uh, you know, those types of services, but they need to have somebody that either they have a, a, you know, a consistent working relationship with or on their team that is able to ensure that uh, accessibility is part of their process. Um, also, if they're going to be submitting responses to you or other materials, um, you know, in regards to like RFP. Uh, are, the, are those types of materials accessible as well? Um, and you could take a you could take a look also at the content of their websites. Do they have any types of case studies or blog posts or white papers that they've done um, that specifically mentions accessibility? Um, and if you're having issues, um, which we definitely have had issues with our vendors, um, you can. Uh, there's a few different things that you might uh, that you might find helpful. Um, the first is if it's in your contract that the finished state should be compliant. Uh, you could argue that uh, if it's not uh, if it's not compliant, you shouldn't actually have to pay for any of those hours. Um, the second one is that for more products and service uh, systems, not necessarily websites, um, accessibility audits are really expensive and they are super time consuming depending on what you are, what you're auditing. A, you know, a basic website, that might take me, you know, an hour or two, but if I'm, you know, going to be auditing our, you know, different types of workflows and depending on who I sign in as, there's different roles and permissions, like, that can, t that can take days, you know, or a full, you know, or a full week of my time. Um, so if I'm going to be if I'm going to be auditing somebody else's system, might want to have a you know might want to have a conversation about how you're saving them a lot of money, and it is something that a lot of accessibility professionals do talk about. Is like you know we're doing a lot of redundant effort here. Um, and the next one is uh, reach out to peer institutions and apply pressure. Um, it's very likely that you are the system that you're using is being used by a lot of other folks too. So uh, you know they. A vendor may not care if like Penn has an issue, but if Penn, Princeton, Harvard, and Yale have the same issue and all reach out to that person, you know, saying, hey, we want this fixed, like, well, they might, they have a good chance of listening to us a little bit more. Um, the Educause IT um, Access Community Group is a awesome place um, to connect with folks or even, and just ask advice, you know, any type of accessibility advice, but also if you are running into an issue with a specific vendor or product, um, you know, again, there are other people out there that likely have that same issue and there might be some way that you can work together. 
All right, so um, some, clo uh, some closing thoughts. Um, not all platforms and tools are created equally, um, and this is especially important to keep in mind if you're recruiting. Um, so if you're gonna be posting anything on social media, you know, just keep in mind that different social media platforms have different accessibility features um, and capabilities. Um, also, don't ever assume that your, uh, your site is easy to use and accessible. It's important to get user feedback. Um, the way that even when I'm auditing, the way that I use a screen reader is not the same way that a person who uses a screen reader every single day because they have to uses a screen reader. Um, so only users can tell us how easy and usable something is. Um, if you don't make your content accessible, you may not know it, or you won't know if your users missed your point or not. Um, if you have an entire like com uh, if you have an entire component that is blind to screen readers or um, isn't toggleable by a keyboard, you know you don't know how well your content is doing if some people just can't get to it. Um, and then, as always, uh, developers and designers are, in fact, cheaper than lawyers. Um, so if you do have a developer or a designer that is very, that is, uh, very reluctant to um, make any changes, um, well, they're a bit cheaper than a lawyer, so you might just want to find, uh, find a new one. Um, but behind all of these checklist rules and regulations, there are just people trying to use your site. Um, so please make it usable for everybody. And if you have any questions, I am happy to answer them. Uh, we, I think we have about 10 or 15 more minutes. So uh, the question was that in the next one to three years, where uh, what would we like to see the uh, the how we would like to see the accessibility initiative um, grow and expand? Is that right? Yeah. Okay. Cool. Um, so I, I ideally for me, I'd like to see um, our team get a little bit bigger. Um, I would like at least a another part time person who can um, help assist with the um, ever growing accessibility needs of our organization. Um, and I think, the, so for me, I think expanding our, our bandwidth um, is very, very important. Um, and I think, the, I think the next thing would be for, um, I would love to see a, I'm trying to think of the best, uh, not like the best way to put this. Um, so we, one of the things that uh, I've at least uh, found a, I don't want to say like problematic, but uh, we don't necessarily have just things that we can give folks that are like, you know, uh, just templates that we can give people, though we are working um, and do have our Drupal starter theme that we can use. Not everybody likes to use Drupal um, and, you know, would love to expand that into WordPress, but I would really like to see more um, broad adoption of some of these component uh, libraries and systems that folks are building around campus. Um, Again, Penn is very, very decentralized. Um, so there's a, you know, there are teams that are doing really awesome work uh, and building out these great tools, but aren't widely shared. Um, so I would really like to see some more centralized, um, you know, some centralized templating, especially for you know, websites and documents um, that obviously are accessible, um, but that are very easily findable um, and usable for folks. So, um, switching gears just a little bit, I'm considering um, doing the CPAC training and becoming certified, and I'm wondering if there are, you know, I live near Philly, in New Jersey, like, are there study groups, you know, because I'm just one person, and I, I know I work better with a group, and people who hold each other accountable are, do you know of any resources, even at Ehead or wherever, for study groups to you know, to have a cohort to go through this training together. It's, I'm, I'm looking for that kind of community support, but I, I'm not really sure even how to go about it. Sure. So the uh, the question was. Um, a was I aware of any um, so, uh, you know, support or study groups or resources um, for uh, taking the CPAC uh, exam? Um, yeah, Penn does have a, uh, you know, there, I know there's a number of folks at Penn who will, uh, they'll get together in a study group to stay for the CPAC, but I know that may, may not exactly help you. Um, I would recommend if you're not already, I think it's, yeah, it's right here. Um, 
it is uh, the web dash a one one y dot slack dot com. Um, so as as you may be able to see, just because I went to it on my browser, they have a whole lot of different um, channels. But one of them, I believe, is um, dedicated to uh, yeah certification prep and certification study group. So if you're not a member of this, I highly recommend joining. Um, it is a very active Slack group, um, and as you know. Any accessibility question you could possibly have, um, you can very likely get it answered uh, by the folks in this uh, Slack. Thank you. Sure. Question? How do you balance your accessibility requirements with faculty and students spinning up websites constantly that you don't know about? Uh, so the question was, how do we uh, how do we balance? Um, our accessibility responsibilities when uh, we have faculty and students uh, spin up sites that we don't know about. That's a great question, and if you know the answer, I kind of like love to know it. Um, yeah, I mean that's a you know that is a uh, you know that's an issue. Um, you know I I work in central IT web hosting, and on my first day I had to uh, you know I asked I'm like oh cool can I have like a list of all of our websites so I can put them into uh, Pope Tech and I was like laugh almost laughed out of the building like a list of our websites um, so you know we didn't, so we kind of had to build that out um, but that's kind of that's where it's really important to raise the visibility of your accessibility requirements and that is something that you know also has been a challenge for us um, though we know the right you know we know the right people we've been talking to the right people but you know we are also Pennsylvania's I think largest private employer so you know there's there's always going to be people who don't know about certain policies um, but you know that said when I come across websites, um, you know, I'll find I'll find a contact there if I if I do if I don't have it in Pope Tech. Um, and I've also uh, you know, it's kind of funny a uh, a lot of a few people on campus kind of know that this has been an issue. So when they find websites, they'll forward it to me. They're like, I doubt you have this one in Pope Tech. So it's kind of you know part of it is um, you know making sure people do are aware of our policies. But you know I would probably say faculty and students are the least aware um, kind of of that. Um, Unless you know, of course, you're uh, a faculty person who you know may have a student with an accommodation, in which case you are from, might be a little bit more familiar with accessibility because you've worked with student disability services before. So yeah, my current problem is faculty hosting course-related websites outside of the university, so like mm -hmm. on GitHub or something yeah. like that, where you know students are going to those sites for course material, but there's no way anybody knows about it until there's an issue. Right. Yeah. I mean, we we do place a you know a priority on making sure everything that's on like that the upenn.edu you know has you know, cuz we also work the other thing is too, we also require sites to all uh, pen sites uh, to have a link to our get help form um, on the footer of their website. So, um, you know, but yeah, it's a it is a it is a growing problem. Um, I don't really know how you stop rogue faculty members and students from doing that. But if you ever find out, please let me know. <laughs> so. so we have another question. Um, so once a new site launches and you it's accessible and it's nice and lovely, how do you? Um, the hope is that it continues to be that way. But how how often do you check back or? What is, what is your best recommendation for keeping the site owners compliant? Sure. So um, uh, we do we do use Pope Tech um, that monitor that does monitor it. It might be a little bit easier um, if I I can also show this to you. Um, but so these are all of our um, so these are all of our users here. Um, we have about yeah. We have 179 pages, uh, or 18 pages, about 179 users. That's what it is. So um, these users are all tied to like different groups. So here you can see, um, you know, School of Arts and Sciences, Graduate School of Education. So um, once the site launches, we will then put that updated URL into Pope Tech. I will trigger a uh, a crawl which indexes all the pages, and then I'll also trigger a scan. If the team that we're working with does not have any active Pope Tech users, we'll set them up with an account. 
out, do a little um, uh, you know, demo and walkthrough about how the tool works. Um, it, is, it is fairly straightforward. Um, and then typically what I do is when I, uh, when I put a new site into Pope Tech, um, I will, let's see, I'll sh can show you here. There's a crawling um, option and then um, scanning options. Uh, there's a way to schedule um, scans. So I usually, what I'll do is I'll have it scan like once every three months or once every four months. Um, and we let folk, and we do let folks know that you know if you're not touching the code on the website, you know you should feel pretty safe just running the um, Pope Tech scans because um, any new errors will likely be introduced by content editors. Um, but if you are going to be deploying any new code, um, we do say to you know check the relevant pages with the Wave Engine and then do another uh, scan with Pope Tech. Uh, and we always encourage folks to that if they're not familiar um, or have um, experience with keyboard and screen reader testing that if they're ever pushing something out and they don't know how to do that or don't have the time or bandwidth to, to just reach out to us and we'll schedule that work as well um, but we do treat our um, kind of like our top 10 sites a little bit differently um, those I will do um, I'll do kind of like full audits on probably like once every six months um, and it, you know, but again, if there's, uh, it also really depends on you know what the teams are. Usually, our top ten sites uh, usually have bigger teams, and I may not have to worry about some of them as much. But um, but yeah, that's that's typically you know how we continue to monitor it. Um, I'll also occasionally check uh, my Pope Tech dashboard for um, like my top uh, top offender sites to see if so when somebody uh, you know did a scan maybe they pushed something that introduced like an error on every page so if i see like a new site be like my top offender site i always reach out um so things like that yep do we have any more oh, got one over here what's your biggest current drive with uh right with drupal and accessibility like maybe something we want to think as an accessible but is or remediating or something hmm. That's a good question. Um, I mean, it's good if you don't have any. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm trying to think of like a recent one that um, that I've had. Um, because I mean, because most of the you know most of the issues that I see um, really stem from like twig templates that people have like put together, um, not necessarily like contrib modules. Because Drupal is really good with accessibility, which I you know personally really appreciate. Um, yeah, I'm. Yeah, I'm not exactly. I don't really think I have a good answer for that one. Um, and uh, for the purposes of the recording, um, I forgot to restate the question. But um, it was, do I have? A, uh, you know, what's my biggest gripe with uh, Drupal and accessibility, or things that they might, you know, that might that people might not think are a big issue? Um, yeah, I don't. Uh, I'd say sometimes the. I, I would say sometimes uh, when people are building out um, complex filtering, uh, complex filters, um, especially with screen reader um, compatibility, um, I think there can be some work done there. Um, for instance, not uh, you know, I've definitely seen views where if they're uh, if they're AJAX views, so they're not triggering that page reload. But if I select a new filter, it's not announced to a screen reader that there's been a change of content. Um, sometimes it works. You know, most of the, you know most of the times I'd say like it does work really well. But um, and I'm not 100% sure why sometimes it does and sometimes it doesn't. But I think that. Um, you know, that might be an area that just all developers need to be aware of is that uh, you know is when you are going to be changing content um, especially in these types of Ajax views um, that type you know that information isn't always communicated back to screen readers so increasing skills around um, and to knowledge around uh, aria best practices aria live regions and um, things like that I think would probably be my answer yeah. Looks like uh, we are at time. Um, so if there are any other questions, you can feel free to, I'm gonna hang around for a bit so you can feel free to find me. Um, my email address uh, is also totally at the beginning of this, but um, you can always uh, reach out to me at ballrap at upenn.edu. And I'm also on that, uh, that web accessibility Slack group uh, as well. So I uh, hope you all have a great rest of your Drupal camp, and yeah, feel free to find me if you want to chat about accessibility. Did you put up the link? I didn't get a chance. Here you go.
bit.ly backslash dcnj underscore access. What was that? Oh, sure, yeah. It is um, web a one y dot slack dot com. Oh yeah, yeah. If any, yeah, if anyone wants an invite, yeah, I forgot about, uh, I forgot about that. Yeah, yeah. Good point. Okay. <laughs> but, uh,